This notion of the church engaging culture. In our Bible reading portion for the day, we're in the book of Acts, we were in chapter 15. I read a verse and it made me think of this. It said, it's a part of the instructions that were given from the, the church leaders in Jerusalem, who all happened to be Jewish. To the non-Jewish believers, the people throughout the empire now that are beginning to put their faith in Jesus of Nazareth as a Messiah. There were tens of thousands of them making those decisions and it was creating some confusion because the Jewish people had a worldview that had come from the law of Moses and the non-Jewish community didn't have that same worldview and it was creating, as you could imagine, some confusion and debate and a great deal of angst. And so it gets pushed back to Jerusalem to the, and the, really the question is being put to the people who had spent those years with Jesus. And this was their con conclusion. It's Acts 15, 29. You have it in your notes, I believe. It says, you are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood and from the meat of strangled animals and from sexual immorality. You'll do well to avoid these things. Those are the instructions. You need to stop sexual immorality. Don't eat animals or food that was offered to demon gods. Don't promote idolatry and abstain from sexual immorality. Can you believe that was the message of the people of God to the culture in which they lived? Well, it caused riots. It caused all sorts of disruptions. The contemporary church is reluctant to echo the words of our predecessors, to follow their lead. Those who actually walked with Jesus, they were engaging in the behavior of the faith community, calling them out of the practices of their contemporary culture. They said, you can't act like the culture. You have to be different. It was unsettling to both sides of that discussion, to the Jewish community and to the Gentile community. Far too often we hide from such discussions with a rather cowardly excuse that we prefer to study our Bible and not be drawn into discussions about current events. Folks, if all we do is study our Bible and we have no voice for current events, we have a theoretical faith and it will not be of much value when you step into the reality of eternity. You're not gonna meet a theoretical God or be evaluated in a theoretical judgment. And it will be awkward to try to rationalize why we chose not to be salt and light. Amen. We don't have to be angry. We don't have to be condemning. We certainly don't need to be belligerent and definitely don't be violent. But we better find the courage to stand for the truth. Amen. Every time we're silent, paganism gains strength. Amen. Which brings me to the, this theme there is a, a seriousness, a matter of belonging that we need to understand. Understand the value of a relationship with Jesus. It's more than joining a church. In Galatians chapter five and verse 24, it says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Folks, to be a Christ follower means you belong to Jesus. In the simplest, most profound expression of those words, it's not confusing. The New Testament tells us in the clearest of language, you're not your own. You belong to God. If you imagine yourself to be a part of the covenant people of God, you belong to him. Amen. It isn't your time or your calendar or your cash. And I'm not asking for any of the above at the moment. but we belong to the Lord. We serve at his pleasure. I'm amazed sometimes at our attitudes. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it reminds us that we've been purchased. The biblical word is redeemed, but to be redeemed means you've been bought out of something. You redeem something that has been pawned. You redeem something that's been put up as a ransom for something else. It says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And any sentence that begins with, do you not know, the, the legitimate answer is no, we probably don't. That your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who's in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your body. Let me give you a little line. It's worth to begin repeating to yourself. It's, it's even valuable to say out loud, it will help you frame some of these challenges that are coming to us. I belong to Jesus and his kingdom. I mean, I have a passport that says I'm a citizen of the United States, but before that, in my order of allegiance, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. I belong to Jesus of Nazareth. 
That is my primary allegiance. I belong to Jesus and his kingdom. We ought to say that together. Can you say that with me? I belong to Jesus and his kingdom. That's the essence of this exchange that we've entered into. There was a price paid so that you and I can be free. Look at Acts chapter 20 and verse eight. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. The purchase price, if we belong to him, the purchase price was that he gave his life, that we might have the privilege of participating in his kingdom. Can you understand how offensive it would be to say, well, I want all of the benefits, but I don't want any of the responsibilities. I want all the opportunities, but none of the liabilities. I want to imagine that I'd be included in your eternal kingdom, that I'd be welcomed into your presence, but please don't ask me to be so vocal that I might have to endure something. Can I just be quiet? We were purchased at an enormous price. First Corinthians seven says you were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. If you'll allow me, don't become slaves of people's opinions. You were bought at a price. Are you one of those crazy Jesus people? Yes, wouldn't you like to be? You mean you actually read your Bible? Uh Uh-huh. You mean you really believe God created the heavens and the earth and every, uh uh-huh. You really really believe every human life has dignity and value? Absolutely, I do. You really believe there's a God, some all supreme, all knowing being who's gonna hold us account? Yes, I do, as a matter of fact. But I don't believe that diminishes my intellect or my awareness or my engagement in the world in which we live. It doesn't diminish your life. It raises the potential of any life that will believe it. In 1 Peter 1, this is the big fisherman. You know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. To his Jewish audience, it's a very familiar set of images a Passover lamb, a sacrifice. But he's saying to us that we were redeemed, we were purchased out of that empty way of life with the precious blood of the Messiah. Revelation chapter five, very near the end of the book, says in heaven they'd gathered together with this amazing picture of worship before the throne of God. And they're saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. We belong to God. Who are you? I'm a Christ follower. What are you? How is it? How is it possible that we teach our children to be advocates for a university sports team before we teach them to be advocates for Jesus? What has happened to us, church? Have we become so idolatrous, so addled, so confused? that our priorities are so messed up. Well, I understand if I I put those words in their mouth when they're young, there could be pushback or no kidding. No kidding. This relationship requires of us a voluntary submission, which is kind of fancy language for surrender. Surrender carries with it kind of a negative connotation. It's a yielding, It's it's a withdrawing, you're not asserting. And in the face of Almighty God, the best response is surrender. He's smarter than we are. He's more powerful than we are. He's wiser than we are. He's kinder than we are. He's more generous than we are. It's a safe idea. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, not his harshness, his mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. The language is a little blind to us. We haven't been engaged in the sacrificial system, but it was a part of the culture of Jerusalem, the worship of Jerusalem for a long, long time. And the animals be presented to the priest and, and their preparation to be a sacrifice means that they would be slaughtered and the, the animals, the, 
the body would be laid on the altar to be consumed by the fire. By the time the animal was placed on the altar, it was void of any life. There was no self-determination left. Nothing jumped off the altar. And that's the imagery that Paul is using in Romans 12. He said, I urge you to offer your body as a living sacrifice. Submit to God. That's not easy. And that's not just a conversation about conversion. That isn't just a discussion about our entrance into the kingdom. That certainly requires some yielding. But to grow up in the Lord, we have to continue to yield to him. Now, there may be some point in my future where that doesn't, isn't difficult, but I can tell you up to this point, and I'm, I'm a pretty much, you know, I'm, I'm young, but it remains a challenge for me. That voice in me that says, I want to do it my way. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I watch too many John Wayne movies. <laughs> well, what's the, I won't be laid a hand on. Yeah, that grows really quickly, doesn't it? And I have to say, no, Lord, I will serve you. I will honor you. I want you to be first. I will not entertain my ways in front of your ways. Don't conform any longer, verse two, to the pattern of this world. See, the pattern of this world says, you're first. You do what you want, when you want, the way you want. Satisfy yourself. Don't yield, you only make the journey one time. Grab all you can get, get all you can, and then can it and sit on a can. That message is so prolific amongst us that we evaluate ourselves against one another. Who did it better than somebody else? We make songs, I did it my way. Folks, that's not a ballad you wanna hang over your head. I belong to Jesus. I want to do it his way. And I'm telling you, that doesn't come easy to me. It may be easier for you. It requires daily attention for me. I have to begin most days by saying, God, show me what it means to honor you today. What do you want me to do today? And I don't mean my calendar's empty, but I mean in the midst of all I have to do and all the responsibilities that may be in the day, what does it look like for me to honor you? Show me what to pick up and what not to. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. 2 Corinthians 5 says we're a new creation, total new kind of being. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. I love that image. The new has come. This is from God. He's reconciled us to himself through Christ. And he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You're a new creation in Christ. You're not just forgiven. So I think we've had the idea that to come to Christ means, oh, God kind of overlooks your indiscretions. He deletes your social media before we even knew we had one. You know, God's got a record. And he says he cast our sins in the sea of his forgetfulness as far as the east is from the west. And so I think we've labored with this notion, well, God doesn't, you know, it's okay, God. That's not it. God paid an enormous price. He offered his son as a sacrifice so that you and I could not just be forgiven, that we could become a totally new creation, a different set of parameters over us. It's not like he took us to the body shop and they hammered out some of the dings and put a little bondo on it and sanded it off and repainted it. We look pretty good. No, you're a totally new creation. You would cry, yes, I belong to Jesus. How is it we've been reluctant? Why have we been, what is up? Well, I don't want to be one of those fanatics. I do. I grew up in Tennessee, folks. The only things that stays in the middle of the road long-term, you don't want to be. <laughs> Just trust me on that. If you're new to Tennessee, you wait. Springtime will bring out some of our critters. In Revelation 21, it says, we have a new future. He'll wipe every tear from their eyes and there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. That's not true for every human being. There's an eternity of brokenness for the people who reject God. It makes a difference what you decide to do with your life. It makes a decision who's Lord of your life. It makes a difference if you serve yourself or you serve the Lord. Who you belong to makes a tremendous difference. 
To offer yourself as a living sacrifice means you get a new future. To choose to honor the Lord with your life each day means God writes a story for you. We've been reluctant. We've been so focused on making friends with the ungodly, we've stopped saying to the church, there's a motivation for holiness. We focus so much on a gospel of salvation that we haven't talked about a gospel of the kingdom. Now, I believe in being born again. I I don't want to diminish that or invite you away from it. But who are you living to please? This is the best response to the rise of paganism. That every life does have value. That marriage is between a man and a woman. That your children matter in the sight of God. And you better treat them like they belong to him. And you have a temporary assignment to steward those lives. You will answer to him for them. That's a serious thing. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, subscribe to the channel. You know the drill, hit the bell for notifications. If you want to, leave a comment.